I need to acknowledge that um, this wasn't the work of one person. Uh, there are a lot of amazing people uh, that I have the privilege of working with uh, who contributed ideas, complaints, um, code, uh, pull requests, uh, tickets, um, late night phone calls uh, to make um, some of the, the things that we're gonna learn about here possible. Um, so these people are really great. Um, what are we gonna do today? We're gonna talk a little bit about uh, the lessons that I've learned uh, from various stages of logging. So there's four major components to the logging infrastructure. It's shipping the logs, parsing the logs, storing the logs, and then doing something with them. A lot of people forget that last step. Don't forget that last step uh, because there's a lot of really cool stuff that you can do with your log data. Um, that said, there are a few assumptions that I'm making here. Uh, and these may not line up with your environments, um, and again, these are my lessons uh, for you as, as tales of caution. Uh, they may not fit exactly with what you're going to do. Um, we had our business intelligence platform already covered uh, by our application logging. So I was free to experiment and to break the system, and so I did frequently, uh, several times a day, uh, sometimes several times a minute, uh, just to, to see what was possible and, and what we could do. Um, our entire infrastructure is Linux servers. Um, yours may not be. Um, that's usually okay. A lot of the stuff that I'm talking, going to talk about will work uh, cross-platform um, with uh, open source or free components anyways. And um, this, this was done during my work as a security engineer at Booking.com. So a lot of this came from the mindset of uh, a security guy trying to do incident response and forensic analysis of a whole bunch of servers all at once. Um, so that's, that's where this project started and it's gone a lot of different ways. So the first thing we wanna talk about is how to get the logs around the infrastructure. Um, and of course at web scale, uh, and that was a transition, transitions are web scale. Um, you may disagree with this, but uh, we're using uh, syslog as a transport mechanism for our system uh, and access log data at booking.com. Why syslog? Um, well, it was already there. Uh, all the submins know about it. Uh, most developers are aware of how to use it. Um, we were using syslog ng, please don't do that, use our syslog. Um, and, but always remember if you are looking at this as an application level logging platform, that syslog calls are blocking. So if you have multiple threads or multiple uh, children that are all writing to the same logging socket, there will be some uh, contention and that will cause dramatic impact uh, to, to your platform. A classic example is, uh, are there any Linux sysadmins in the room? Has anyone ever enabled IP tables with the logging uh, thing and then watched the network performance of the box drop off? That's because you're competing for um, write access on, on dev log. So keep that in mind. Um, there are ways around this uh, to, to make uh, syslog a lot faster, um, but keep that in mind. Yes? So our syslog is the system service? Yes. So that'll go block? Yes, it will. Yes. Um, so syslog ng, one of the things that uh, I was told as to why we selected syslog ng, this was before I got there, is that it's pretty. And that is pretty elegant. Someone um, that isn't uh, a sysadmin can probably read this and understand the author's intentions. And that's the key here. You're reading the intentions of the author. Um, there, there's some subtle bugs here. Um, I'll, I'll point a few of them out. Uh, first off, um, anything that doesn't match our filter is silently discarded. There's no log entry for the rest of the stuff that fell through the cracks, right? So that, that data is gone, and we'll never know about it again. Has anyone seen follow frequency on a, a, a file entry in syslog ng? Has anyone seen that before? Um, that, that's basically syslog ng, uh, by default, will use epoll or inotify to find out if a file has more content on it, to then forward that through the, the chain. Um, you usually see a follow frequency when someone enables that on something like an access log that runs through a lot of data and then causes a high CPU load because tailing that one log file is taking up all of the resources for that one thread in syslog ng. So they add a follow frequency one, which reads that access log just once a second and checks to see if there's new data. Subtle bug, it only reads log fetch limit lines per second. Who wants to take a guess as to what the default is on that particular configuration parameter? Yes, it's 10. So in this case, we said, oh my God, the performance of tailing this log file is too much. We can't handle it, so we're gonna follow it uh, just once a second. 
And now we've limited our access logs to 10 messages per second, uh, which may not be what you intended. This bug existed at booking for six years. But like, like I said, we have application uh, logging enabled that we do all of our business intelligence off of, so the only people who are suffering were the sysadmins. Okay, so I said RSSLog is better, so why don't we do something complicated with RSSLog? Like, if the remote server's down, let's queue everything locally on disk. That way, um, we're not stressing any intermediary endpoint. All of our clients are queuing their own messages on disk, which we should be able to maintain for a few minutes, a few hours, or in most cases, a few days without causing any problems. Let's send all that data over TCP, encrypted, with peer validation of the, SS of the TLS certificates. And that's, that's it. It's certainly not as beautiful as the syslog ng configuration is, but with this you have uh, peer validated certificates, you have TCP transport, and um, an on-disk queue in case the uh, remote server goes away. So you won't lose any data. Additionally, um, our syslog supports a number of outputs. Um, so y you can do traditional things like forwarding data around, sending data to file, uh, through sockets, um, out to databases directly, which means if you just are looking at the simple data that you want to get out of syslog, uh, you can do that very easily without adding any other components into your system. It's already there. And then you can also send it out to something like Elasticsearch, MongoDB, Kafka, or HDFS natively from our syslog, which is kind of nice. Um, and this is even cooler if your mail administrator comes up to you and says, hey, uh, we want to find a way to stress test our SMTP infrastructure, you can go, yes, we can. <clears throat> okay, I will. Um, but I, I hear, uh, especially at a lot of meetups with all the, the fancy new technologies, that syslog isn't web scale. And it's not, it's not a pub sub queue. If you're interested in, in working with a pub sub queue for your application logs, um, I recommend taking a look at something like Apache Kafka. It's nice, uh, it, it supports um, downtime on your consumers so that you can uh, pick up right where you left off if your consumers die, um, and it feeds directly into Apache Spark so your data analysts are able to natively work with your logging data as soon as you enable the pipeline, which is nice. Um, if you're looking for something lightweight that's gonna get your data from one point to another, um, take a look at NanoMessage. Um, Beyond that, there's, there's zero MQ, rabbit MQ, active MQ, anything with MQ in the name is really cool. And a lot of devs are convinced that Redis is a Q, uh, though it's not. I would recommend not using that for uh, something high volume. It's also not a logging pipeline. Uh, Facebook designed Scribe and there's the Apache Flume project for application pipelining of log data. Uh, if you're looking for something very formalized, uh, very um, particular about uh, the fields and, and, and the ability to enforce those things, uh, you might want to look at Flume and Scribe. That didn't really work too well for us. And it's not a full logging platform. So all of the work that I'm going to talk to you about today is stuff that we did before these projects were mature enough to be able to handle data at scale uh, or before they even existed. So if I were to start this today, the first place I would start would be looking at HECA, uh, which is a, a full logging platform um, that addresses a number of the problems that I had uh, when I was evaluating things like Logstash. Um, if HECA didn't fit your infrastructure for some reason, because it is Go and maybe you don't have experience deploying Go projects and you don't want to add that to your infrastructure, uh, FluentD is an excellent uh, uh, alternative to something like HECA, though it's a, it doesn't quite deal with all of the issues that HECA does. It does do a really great job. I, I put Logstash up here because um, I think uh, we owe Logstash a, a, a lot of credit for really making this uh, space interesting, entertaining, fun, um, and something that we can all get behind. However, um, I had no luck scaling Logstash beyond a few hundred machines, and uh, the, the talk that the, the guys that designed HECA uh, gave on why they designed HECA confirms that things haven't gotten much better in the few years that I've been working on this project. Uh, so Logstash, I, lots of credit. Ton, I love the work that Jordan Sissel do, did on, on Logstash. It just it could not keep up with our log volumes. So I would actually argue that Syslog is web scale. First off, it's boring technology, and we need more boring technology. Uh, we need to simplify the endpoints. Um, this gives your endpoints more uh, CPU, more resources to be able to serve your customers. That's the most important thing. If you can solve a problem without burdening the endpoints and you make your application faster, you've done your job as a sysadmin. The other nice thing about Syslog is that it's easy to understand. Um, there are tons of resources available online right now for configuring Syslog, uh, so whether it's Syslog NG or uh, our Syslog. 
and anyone uh, from sysadmin to a dev can understand these documents and get things working, get things moving through the, through the logging pipeline uh, without burdening your endpoints. And I've heard uh, Perl isn't wet scale. And, and I disagree. Um, I, I built this all in, Pe or, well, we as a team built this all together in Perl uh, with Poe as a back end. And it outperformed Logstash uh, just out of the gate. After a day's worth of work, I was able to outperform Logstash in consuming a logging stream and tokenizing a ton of data. Um, right now, we're doing 60,000 messages per second on each processor node, and, and that's only constrained by Elasticsearch indexing speed. Uh, so I have plenty of extra resources available to do even more message processing, and I'm just stuck at the number of nodes I have in the Elasticsearch cluster. Yeah. Were there any questions on any of that before I go forward? Yes. Um, I would say uh, if you're looking at the access and application logs of anything more than a few hundred servers, you're into the area of you need to think about how to scale things and how you're going to divide and, and conquer that problem. Um, a few hundred servers, you can probably do this all of this off of a single instance log stash um, box going into you know a three node Elasticsearch cluster. Uh, beyond a few hundred servers, I, I would say maybe 500 servers into the thousands, you're going to have to start adding a little bit of complexity. Um, so this is a Perl conference, um, and so I want to talk a little bit about parsing log data. Um, if we're using syslog, uh, we get some stuff for free. Um, we, we know when the log happened because the timestamp is part of the syslog uh, RFC. We know which server sent the log. Always use fully qualified domain names when you're syslogging. There's no excuse to use short host names. We'll talk about why in a, min in a minute. Um, you also get the log level um, and the facility, so you get whether it was a debug through emergency and then you also get the, the arbitrary facility that, that you decided to attach to your log. Um, and then you get the program that generated the log sometimes, most of the times, depending on the vendor, and uh, the content of the message. So when I, when I started down the project of, of looking at logging stuff, and this was back in 2007 before I joined Booking.com, I, I was looking for something that could parse a syslog message uh, and give me something back. Um, and I didn't find anything that was very performant on the CPAN, so I created my own. Um, as is the case with everything, you always create your own. Um, and the, the objectives were to create order from chaos, to take this freeform text that's coming in via syslog and transform it into a document, into a, into a hash, associative array, dict, whatever you want to call it. Um, I wanted it to be fast. I wanted it to be the fastest parser on CPAN because I wanted to handle high volumes of data. And I wanted to be able to support vendors that don't um, follow standards. Um, and I, it was an exploration in how much I could tolerate from vendors as well, which was uh, handy. Um, what, what is interesting, though, is Cisco actually includes a second date stamp in the uh, syslog message uh, after the host but before the program. Um, and that date format is usually ISO 8601, except for when it's not. Uh, and the original timestamp is still there. And they include an extra character at the end of the date, which will tell you whether or not that device is configured to use NTP and whether or not the NTP has been able to sec successfully update in the past few seconds. Um, and parse syslog line understands that and can actually tell you if you're syslogging, if, if you're parsing Cisco data, whether or not your devices are configured to use NTP and whether the NTP has been updated properly. So there, there's a lot of people have contributed uh, by sending me log messages that, it, that parse syslog line didn't work on. So thank you for that because I was able to make them work. So basically we get something like this and it goes into something much larger. Uh, the cool thing here is that that wonderful date stamp that you get from um, syslog has been transformed into an ID, ID, ISO 8601 format, which you can then use in a whole bunch of other things and transform rather easily. You'll also notice that it got bigger. There's a lot more crap here, and uh, that's okay. I, I don't mind that. Um, so some of the things that I learned from writing this module were, uh, well, vendors never comply with standards. They always create their own. Uh, always use const fast, never read only.pm, thank you, Sawyer. Um, good regexes are really fast, actually faster than BNF parsers in, in uh, Perl right now. Um, and untested regular expressions are dangerously slow. Hey, how many people write regular expressions in this room? <laughs> cool. How many of you actually test those regular expressions to see how fast they are? 
cool, you guys are doing it right. Uh, I've been doing it wrong for a long time. This was a project that taught me how to do things right. Um, the other thing I learned is that Perldoc, uh, Perl RE lies to you sometimes. Uh, one particular instance is the slash O. Does anyone know what slash O is as a modifier at the end of a regular expression? Can someone tell me what it's supposed to do? I'm serious. Yeah, the, 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 okay, so that's one, one, one definition. Okay, the, that's another definition that I've seen, and I've also heard, and the actual, uh, I think the current Perl doc, Perl RE, just says, we'll introduce bugs into your code. Um, <laughs> which, which is interesting, because um, I, I don't know if you guys have used Damien Conway's regexp common, um, but I adopted this type of, let me define all my regular expressions once, and then write my code, and then when I actually write the regular expressions, I will use the named regular expression from the regular expression hash so that someone reading my code can understand what I'm attempting to match there. And if they're really interested in the nasty guts of what I'm trying to match, they can go back up to the top of the file and see the regular expressions. However, there's a little bit of a problem with this. So here are four identical um, regular expressions running through a, a loop of uh, 50,000 um, and the test data, I have a, a few gists uh, on GitHub that demonstrate this using different variations on all kinds of, of, of things, but there's two million entries in each one of these. And what's really surprising to me is that um, there's a two times performance gain simply by adding the slash O to the end of this. Uh, so using this regex table thing that, that kind of became common and made my code more readable is actually really bad for performance. And again, this is what it says in the current Perl doc Perl RE about uh, slash O. Actually in 520, it's not even present in 522 in the Perl RE. Uh, the reason that you can introduce bugs is because this top example is perfectly okay because as the gentleman specified back here, it only interpolates the variable once. So for the entire execution of the program, if that regular expression is not going to change, this optimization works and gets you near to a static regular expression um, performance as it's supposed to do without slash O according to everyone that I've talked to that's touched the regex code. However, if you were to do this particular example, what you end up with is the first time through sets that regular expression for the entire execution of your program. So if you're using variable regular expressions in a, in a lookup table, um, then slash O is dangerous and will introduce um, bugs into your code. But I think this distinction is worth pointing out and worth noting, especially if we're going to be doing stuff at, at high speed. Okay, so back to logs as, as documents. Um, does anyone recognize this? this format. It's a little bit, yeah, it's a, it's Apache access log format. Does anyone see what's going on here? Yeah, someone's trying to inject on our, our website uh, to a file that doesn't exist, actually. They're trying to inject PHP into our site. We don't have any PHP on our front end, uh, so that, that's an indicator for me that there's something going sideways here. But at the top, you have the message uh, elements that are coming directly uh, from syslog itself. Um, the the Facility and priority are encoded in the integer at the beginning. Um, the dates, date format in an incredibly usable date format, um, especially useful for writing tests when you're trying to, to uh, distribute this because there's no year. So every time the year rolls over, all of my tests fail. So I have to hard code the, the year on parse syslog lines test suite. Um, and then the fully qualified domain name that we have here um, and, and the program which we override to be the V host that uh, is the, the termination point. And then we have a bunch of content. This is all just content, and this is kind of the breakdown that you would get out of running this data through parse syslog line. Those are the only distinctions. Um, we can uh, do a little bit better than that. So if we're using fully qualified domain names for our uh, logging entries in, in syslog, um, I don't know about you, but for us, we encode information in our domain names because they're supposed to make it more useful for humans. Uh, so things like data center ID and the environment or zone that are present in our domain name. So whether it's production, whether it's development, uh, whether it's another zone are present in the fully qualified domain names, um, as well as the data center ID. And then again, well-known well uh, log formats are easily tokenized. Uh, so how many people have written an Apache access log uh, parser? Yeah. So there's a ton of them. Uh, you, can, you can easily reuse code uh, to chunk that up. 
Or you can do something really simple and stupid, which is awesome. Just look for a curly brace in the syslog message. And if you see a curly brace, substring from that point until the end curly brace, or actually to the end of the, the, the line is what I do. And if it decodes as JSON, then you have a tokenized representation of that field already ready. And somebody can start uh, indexing data directly into Elasticsearch however they'd like, simply by uh, sending a syslog message. Um, so these are some things that you should do. Uh, all of that comes from the log message itself. Here's some things you shouldn't. I don't like to tell people not to do things because there are trade-offs that you're making here when you do some of these things. Um, so for me, they don't make sense, but for you, they, they might be okay, but you need to know what you're getting yourself into. So you shouldn't write bad regular expressions. I mean, that goes without saying, but you should test those regular expressions. You should be able to turn them on and off and run through a benchmarking suite and see, did I have a statistically significant impact on the performance of the program? Being off by one or two percent is not statistically significant in the case of uh, benchmarking usually. Uh, so did I decrease the performance by 30 percent? Okay, maybe that's a bad regular expression. The other thing we found is that calls to external sources are incredibly expensive, especially when you're talking about 60,000 to 120,000 log messages per second. If your HTTP API introduces even 100 millisecond lag time into each message, you're suddenly not able to scale the infrastructure anymore and you have to multiply your uh, processing farm by 100 times. Some of these things are better served at the lookup time, right? So once I have the data in there and I want to go back and fetch that data um, as a consumer of it, then maybe I can perform those things because waiting those extra few seconds isn't going to be a big deal for me as a consumer, but it will be a huge deal for the computers. So I don't expect you to be able to read this, but you can. This is an example of that that previous uh, Apache access log. Um, after so this is what it was before, and it got bigger here. Um, the main things I wanted to point out are that um, we've basically split this into uh, kind of key values. And we've looked at things that are interesting. We've taken them out of the log stream and made them key value pairs so that we can easily reference that data later and do it cheaply in our data store. Um, so that, that's kind of cool, but we can do more. Um, these are access logs after all. Uh, so we have URIs available to us. We know which host terminated those points. Uh, we, we know the full URI string. So we can actually evaluate the, the uh, request URI and uh, break out everything uh, that is the path to the file. So now I can look at pivoting on individual pages rather than pages and their parameters. Then I can introspect into those parameters. Take a look at the ones that are interesting. Don't make the mistake that I made because you'll learn a lot of stuff about the way your site works by doing this. At, at first I just said, okay, I'm gonna take all the request parameters and I'm gonna store them in a, in a hash in, in uh, Elasticsearch and I'm just gonna cram it in there and everything will work. And it did. Uh, and then I realized that we have dynamic keys for our URI parameters. Uh, so I had over two and a half million uh, unique keys um, in, in, in storage, which causes massive problems with Elasticsearch. You don't want to have two and a half million unique keys. Uh, values are fine, keys not so much. Um, so extract things that are interesting. For us, interesting, especially from a security perspective, things like hotel ID, uh, transaction number, um, user identifiers. If those things are present, we like to pull them out of the message stream and put them in as their own key value pair in the document so that we can pivot and search on those, those unique pairings. Um, the other thing we did was, you saw the SQL injection that, that was attempted. Um, we, we'd look at the URI string, um, both un raw and then we attempt to URI decode uh, that full um, URI string to see if there's any uh, common words that we associate with uh, attacks. Uh, and then we also needed GOIP data so we did that locally from a local database not through a web API uh, to, to save some time. So in, what we did was we added stuff like this into the uh, document. So here you can see there's some scoring information um, about how likely this is to be some sort of an attack. Um, in this case, you, you actually get, uh, I decided to tokenize each individual thing that triggered my attack scoring algorithm um, so that we could evaluate the effectiveness of our um, algorithms we were building. And then we also had the refer, so we decided to tokenize that. And we ran it through the same thing that you would run the URI encoding through, and we pulled out all the interesting data out of the refer. So we get the domain and the file so that we can look at, we can pivot on refers, which was interesting from a security perspective. So the lessons that I learned from this were um, 
test the performance of the system. It's key to be able to disable and enable new features in your parsing stream to understand the impact it has uh, at, at scale. Um, so that you can see that you can keep up with the data. If you can't test it, it you shouldn't be introducing it because you could break something that someone has uh, come to rely on. Uh, work with the data you have. Um, the NSA is really good at this and so can you. Um, so there's a lot of data in the log stream um, that you can just take advantage of. And it's cheap to take advantage of what you already have rather than going, well, you know, here's the short host name. Let me call out to my server inventory system to get the rest of the information about it. No, just log the fully qualified domain and then chunk it from there and stash that. You're good. Um, and then tokenize the data that you're interested in into a set of well-defined fields. Any questions about that stuff? Because now we're getting into ELK. Um, everyone know what ELK is? Other than this, it's the Elasticsearch Log Stash Kibana ecosystem. Um, it, Elasticsearch was originally started as a, a distributed free text search engine. Um, and it did not perform quite as well as something like Apache Solar for that use case, but it did scale very e easily. So it was adapted by people like me who decided to break it and use it for logging. And uh, Elastico acquired um, Logstash and uh, Kibana. Um, and now they have a platform for logging. And we've broken it a lot. Um, so these are things that we actually tested and broke. Uh, some of this stuff is advice that you will get uh, from reading blogs. Uh, never content with just taking something off of a blog, I decided to uh, uh, tweak it. And a few of my coworkers helped me test a few variations of this. Um, you'll hear, don't go above a 30 gig heap. You're not going to increase any of your. You're not going to increase performance. Confirmed. That is true. Um, we ran a uh, machine with a 60 gig heap. And we compared it to that uh, of another system running two 30 gig heaps. And the two 30 gig heaps performed twice as good as the one 60 gig heap. Uh, so there was no performance gain by going over this 30 gig limit. Uh, that said, leave about 25% of the memory available for the file system cache. Elasticsearch does a lot of I.O. And having that cache available and hot is good. If you're us How many are using Elasticsearch today in their production infrastructure? Have you guys uh, read the Call Me Maybe papers on Elasticsearch? Uh, because they're very interesting. They talk about the uh, cap uh, performance of Elasticsearch. So there, there's some things that, that you may be surprising. Um, for instance, in some cases, you may have as low as 96% of the data that you're writing to Elasticsearch actually ending up on disk in some cases. Um, and then on the other end, when you perform a search, you may only be hitting a certain much smaller percentage of the data that you have available. These are things you need to know so that you can make those assumptions and, and make the right calls with stuff. Um, separate your master and data nodes. Um, just this is, this is good. Your data nodes should never be able to elect themselves master of the cluster. It just works better for consensus in Elasticsearch. And then namespace index is based on your retention needs. Um, so it's very expensive to delete a document in Elasticsearch. It's cheap to drop uh, an index. So that's how you should think about designing uh, indexes. Um, so in order for you to understand the next few things, I'm going to have to talk to you a little bit about sharding in the shards in Elasticsearch. Um, an index is made up of a number of shards, and data is automatically, shard based, automatically sharded based on ID unless you specify a different algorithm for uh, allocating data. But spoiler alert, most people don't. It's sh sharded by automatic uh, UUID generation. And so what Elasticsearch is doing is actually providing a real-time wrapper around Lucene. Uh, and it does that through this, this blue piece here called the transaction log, which is a pre-Lucene real text search um, uh, pre, uh, buffer uh, of data. Um, and that, every once in a while, is flushed out to Lucene into a segment. Now, when a segment gets to a certain size, it can no longer be written to. So a new segment is spawned. Uh, and the next transaction log will flush to that segment. So what you end up with is you have a series of shards, and inside of those shards you actually have micro shards, which are called Lucene segments, um, which can be a variable size and can be completely, um, can duplicate a lot of data. Um, so this, this one shard may be, um, let's say, 50 gigs uh, of data contained in these segments. Um, you can run a command to optimize those shards, which runs what's called the merge, to merge uh, the, the segments together so that each shard uh, contains a fixed number of segments, and you can specify how many you'd like. Um, the default is two. 
uh, but most people will set that to one, and then you end up with something like this, where you have one leucine segment, uh, fewer segments mean less mapping and less reducing, um, and more web scale. But the problem is um, that this is a very expensive operation, and it's done, it's performed mostly in memory. So if you're going to take a bunch of, uh, let's say, 50 gigs of data and merge it together, you're doing that at an almost 10 to 30 percent of the disk's usage in the merge operation. So if you're doing a lot of logging, you cannot afford to perform uh, segment maintenance and optimize. Um, the, the nice thing about segment um, optimization, though, is that the search performance is dramatically increased when you're down to a single uh, segment. Um, and so is disk space. So a 50 gig segment may migrate, may uh, optimize down to something like 30 gigs, or sometimes you'll even get uh, 20, uh, a full like 50% compression off of merging uh, segments together. So here are some settings that we use um, for Elasticsearch, um, the, the process. Uh, the first one is, is disabling the memory mapping of the uh, shards um, and using the, the built-in uh, Java NeoFS uh, memory map or um, shared concurrent read uh, library. Um, the default is to use a bo both memory mapped and uh, NeoFS as dependent, but we found that Elasticsearch is really bad at predicting its future memory usage. So anything that's going to use memory that isn't necessary, you should disable. Uh, the second thing is the refresh interval. Um, this is going to be the amount of time that a document arriving in the indexing uh, is held before it is flushed to disk. So for us, we've said we can tolerate 30 seconds of, of uh, data in memory. So if we lose that node, we lose 30 seconds of data. You can tweak this, um, but we, we're trying to get more control over when these operations occur so that there's more, um, that, that they're more visible and that failures don't cascade. The second thing is I was talking about merging earlier. Um, merges occur uh, whether you like it or not. Um, you can't really control that, but what you can do is tell Elasticsearch only use one thread for merges. So this will prevent you from having um, like eight concurrent merges at one time competing for 30 gigs of memory, which is really only probably 12 gigs of memory after all the housekeeping that Elasticsearch is doing. Um, so we, we set that down to one, one thread um, to prevent that. And then the other thing is a transaction log. I talked about this in the previous slide. It was that blue box. It's the pre-Lucene segment. We're saying it can get up to one gig large before it needs to be flushed out to a Lucene segment. And then you can configure uh, cache sizes. Uh, the newer versions of Elasticsearch are much better at managing their cache sizes automatically. Uh, we had to manually configure this uh, quite extensively on earlier versions of Elasticsearch. This is what our index layouts look like. Um, so this is for our access log data. Uh, we've split it by data center tag. This is uh, artifacts from Elasticsearch 019 where you could not tribe nodes. So if you wanted to have data, uh, two clusters each, um, that communicated as one living in two separate data centers, you would have to do a trick like this. And what it says is essentially any index that starts with this data center tag, um, the shards can only be allocated inside of this data center. So if I try to create one of these, these uh, AMS4 uh, indexes, the shards will all be allocated to the nodes in AMS4. And if, if the AMS4 data center can't handle those shards, then that index isn't created. It's not migrated automatically to another data center. This prevents any type of communication between the data centers. Um, and there is one, one thing that this does, uh, one compromise we're making here, which may not be okay for you, but is okay for us. If the link between the data centers goes down, we lose visibility between to that logging data that's in the, the other side of the cluster. But for us, we're like, then we have bigger problems anyways. We're not going to want to look at Kibana dashboards. We know that we're screwed, so let's, uh, let's not replicate that data back and forth. Some things you can do to optimize um, the indexes. Um, split them in the functional namespaces. I already mentioned this. Uh, based on retention periods is the most easy way. Like, I'm going to need this data. I'm going to want it for six months. OK, cool. I only need this data for 30 days. Cool. Then those are two separate index uh, names. Uh, that, that, that way, you can delete them uh, very, sim very easily. Um, use dynamic mappings. These are schemas for your schemaless data. I'm sorry to admit, there is no panacea of schemaless data. If your data is schemaless, um, Elasticsearch will, will attempt to do some black magic, which means that the first document that go comes in with a new field, it will guess the type. And from that point on, every other document must meet that type constraint for that field, or that document is discarded. So. Use dynamic mappings to tell it what you expect fields to be, whether, and if you expect them to just be strings, you can tell it it's just a string, I don't care. 
Uh, there's an auto expand replicas feature. I, I'm even sorry to have to mention it. Don't ever look for it. Don't look it up. Don't use it. It's, it's bad. Um, and of course, uh, fewer replicas um, mean better write performance uh, because re um, writes are actually replicated um, without any type of binary optimization. So writes are passed uh, to all the nodes that need those writes uh, and those binary operations are performed uh, on each node individually. Elasticsearch cheats, okay? Um, it stores as much stuff about your data and memory as possible. So here, um, what I learned, and this is really interesting because I didn't know this, but every document inside of your instance uses eight bytes of memory. So if you have two billion documents on a node, you're using a significant amount of memory just to have those documents there. Why? Because the ID of the document, the timestamp of the document, and the shard, the location on disk, of the document needs to be indexed so that your data can be retrieved fast. So Elasticsearch just happily keeps it in memory for you. Um, analyzing fields is expensive. Uh, if anyone's worked with Lucene, anyone? Lucene? Yeah, analyzing stuff, you can do all kinds of really cool stuff with things, right? Um, I don't ever need that with logs. My logs talk to me in their native language. I just need the representations of those. So all of my fields are stored unanalyzed in Elasticsearch, except for one, and that is the full message string, which we tokenize just based on white space um, so that we can, we can search it. Um, it's really important, and I already mentioned this, and again, it's another one of those things that needs to be driven home. Uh, agree on a, a, a name, uh, a field set for your documents, okay? Um, if you want some guidance, there's, um, there's about, there's six of them right there. There's about 40 or 50 of them, and the best thing to do is just simply invent your own. You're going to need to monitor and maintain Elasticsearch. It doesn't do this by itself. Um, delete old indexes that you're not using anymore. Degrade replicas, so basically what we say is over time, uh, the indexes become less important to us so we can tolerate more failure. So we degrade the number of replicas in our indexes as time moves forward. Um, that, that frees up documents, right? So every replica is also counting against your document count in that eight bytes of memory. So we, we age those out. Um, close unused indexes, if you're only searching back a week, if 90% of your searches are over just a week of data, then maybe just close everything that's 30 days or older. Opening an index is a very cheap operation. It takes a second to open an index in our cluster, and we have thousands of shards. So you, you could do this very easily. Um, disable bloom filters um, on indexes that are no longer being written to. They consume a lot of memory just to tell Elasticsearch what already exists, which fields exist, and the cardinality of those fields so it knows how to optimize queries in, in, uh, for writing. So you can disable that once you're done writing to it. And then monitor key metrics. You don't have to do this yourself. We've written a series of utilities uh, to handle all of these things based on the, um, the way that we lay out indexes, but these also work uh, with any, any format of indexes, whether it's daily, hourly, um, monthly, weekly, whatever you're going to use. Um, the um, script here is basically saying close anything that's 90 days or older that looks like a log stash index, delete anything that's 180 days or older, and then uh, set the, conform to zero replicas after seven days with a max number of replicas of two. So over time, the, the replicas are degraded, and at seven days, we're down to replicas min, which is zero. So we only have the primaries available for searching after seven days. Um, we, we also like to optimize stuff for programming and making things easy for programmers to do. So we have a way to control aliases that link up to the indexes. So here, the first one just basically takes, you can see the pattern, the star at the end, at the beginning here, that's to match anything that comes before. Um, so if it's AMS4 or LHR4, and then it aliases it to uh, log stash date. So now when you search log stash date, you'll search every index, all the data centers that are available and currently reporting that they have an alias available for that. Um, then we also do a relative so that we can say, uh, go f all the way back uh, seven days till today and then tag it as log stash weekly. So we can write scripts against the weekly indexes and we never have to com compute what the weekly index actually is in the script. It makes, it just, it's a lazy hack uh, for something that we, we can do very easily. So basically what that looks like is you have these indexes, uh, they both have the same uh, alias, so when you search access 2014, 10, 28, which this, I generated this a while ago, um, you will receive uh, all the results from both of those indexes. Elasticsearch has a, um, a monitoring suite called Marvel. It uses Elasticsearch to monitor Elasticsearch. The only problem with that is if your Elasticsearch isn't working, your monitoring also isn't working. And that's not really that helpful 
So to get around this, what they recommend is to build a separate cluster to monitor your Elasticsearch clusters with Marvel. Um, I prefer just using something like Graphite uh, because a lot of this is just time series data anyways. Uh, so we wrote a, a, a script that basically just scans the, the full Elasticsearch stats API and, and dumps all of that data into Graphite for you. So you, this is all you have to run um, if, and you have data going uh, into Graphite. Okay, 10 minutes to do this using logs. Um, this is that last part that I said is really important because now you've got everything there, you're happy. Um, how, do you, how do you start using data? So if you haven't seen Kibana before, this is Kibana. Here's an overview of our web logs. Um, there's a breakdown uh, by the vhost, so which sites, and then uh, the access by country. And then over there you see that web attack score, which gives us an indication if someone's scanning us. Here's an overview of the web attacks that occurred. And I intentionally didn't blur those IPs because um, those guys aren't nice, so I'm not going to be nice. Um, the, top, the top is the number of incidents that are occurring. So these are requests with uh, suspicious looking uh, characters in them. And then uh, the, the bottom one is the um, total score of all of those requests over time, which is why those two look a little bit different. Over here, you have the vhosts that are being attacked. And then um, the source IP by the top score, by the, the cumulative score, and then countries. And you can see the US is really malicious. Um, and then at the bottom, there's a table where you can actually investigate all these little things. Um, we've been trying to convince devs not to log, devs and sysadmins not to log into endpoints. Um, so we built a sudoers wall of shame. Um, so <laughs> the top, the top is by username, right? So you see that yellow line right there? That is a single user using sudo in a while true loop. Okay, and this is actually very common uh, in our infrastructure. And, and the, the nice thing about a page like this is that I can talk to someone like the CIO and it, pull this page up and show him, here's how people are using, uh, abusing our systems. Do you think that this is okay? Um, and then he can go, no, I don't think it's okay. And then when he says don't do this, it comes with a little bit more weight than when I say don't do this. And the other thing you'll notice is that that yellow line is probably representative of LS of dash I, which you probably can't see because it's a little bit blurred. But basically this, this dev is monitoring the network performance using LS of dash I. The side effect, the, the Heisenberg principle here, is that monitoring uh, the network performance using LS of dash I actually affects, negatively affects the network performance of the device that you're monitoring because it has to read those statistics and pause what it's doing. So you end up with you know, dev actually hurting a production system. When I was putting together dashboards to show you, I came across stuff that I didn't know existed. Someone found this and started making dashboards to figure out who's abusing graphite. Um, so this is, this is, these are graphs of, uh, of different, um, different queries that are taking more than one and a half second for the render API to return. Um, and then down below, he's, he's got the host names uh, that, are, that are making those calls so that he can track those people down and smack them with a the ruler. Um, another dev decided he wanted to see um, exactly what the slowest pages were using the information that's coming from Nginx. Nginx gives us an upstream and a request milliseconds uh, per page. So here he grouped it by um, um, roles. So you see, uh, dub, I, I think there's like our, our www site uh, is one of the lines and then our admin site, which is for hotels, is another line, and then a few other internal sites. I don't remember exactly which ones they were, and I blurred them out for, for safety. Um, and then you can actually get a breakdown of, of those um, pages uh, over here, where it's all blurred out, because I'm not disclosing that information, is the, um, the pages that were really slow to load. And then on the other side is actually the source IP country. So you can find really interesting bugs. Like, for instance, um, we had a bug in the right-to-left processing, and that took longer to display. And so countries that use right-to-left languages showed up in this page as taking longer than, uh, you know, a, a significant amount of time longer than uh, comparable left-to-right languages. So that's kind of neat. But I'm a command line junkie, um, and I really liked uh, uh, Will Stevenson's talk yesterday on um, machine learning, and he talked about how um, this is an exploratory process. It's not, there's not like a, an algorithm you apply. You need to know what you're trying to do before you can do it. You can't just have something learn to do what you're doing. Um, so part of our investigations, we need to be able to do things that we couldn't easily do in Kibana, we need to do them fast and we need to pipe them to different places. So we created this utility, and it's also in app, uh, app Elasticsearch utilities called essearch.pl, uh, which allows you to do searches. Um, this is Lucene query syntax up top. There's actually a bug in this query syntax, um, and the and is lowercase. 
So if you do and lowercase in the Lucene query syntax, you basically are doing an or across all of your things with the word and included as one of the or statements, and you don't get back what you're expecting. So what I do is I actually parse the, uh, the query that you're sending and look for things that are common mistakes, like lowercase and, lowercase or, lowercase not, and translate them into um, their, their equivalent syntax. Um, so here you can see that this is just showing us uh, some 404s on the site with the source IP and the, the actual file. Um, you can then facet or aggregate that data very easily. You just say, you know, show me the top uh, source IPs from uh, desk.booking.com and you get this data back. And this works across multiple days. So the way that I designed ES search is it works over a time period of days. Uh, so it'll perform a search across one day and then it will go to the next day and then to the next day. Um, so what you see is a duplicated thing here because it's only going across one day, but you get an aggregate at the bottom of all of the data that you got back. Um, not super interesting, those are all Google bots. So then with the aggregations that they added in Elasticsearch, I want to be able to do cool stuff like show me the top file by the number of distinct source IP countries that have accessed it. And of course it is what you would expect it to be. It's slash is their most commonly visited file uh, across all of the country codes. But then you can see something interesting happens here. There's a, there's a degradation of about three country codes from the first one to the second one. And what that actually is, is the, the MaxMind Geo IP tag, one of them is A1, and A1 means um, anonymous proxy. And in this case, those are bots that are not making the asynchronous JavaScript requests that the rest of the site, the, the rest of the normal users would be making. So A1 is one of the representations that is not, that is in the first uh, group, but not in the second group. So there's kind of like weird stuff in there. Uh, and that's cool, but, um, I want to be able to, to chain these things together and do, um, you know, one query leads to the next query, leads to the next query, and, it, and eventually it's 12 hours later and you haven't slept and everything is awesome. You have discovered the secret to the universe. Um, so here, um, I built another uh, utility which Apple Elasticsearch Utilities uses called CLI Helpers to handle input and output to the terminal. Um, and one of the options that CLI Helpers allows you to do is specify a data file and then anytime you call output, you can tag that line as data and that line will go out to the data file in addition to going out to wherever else it's supposed to. So this does what you would expect it to do. It looks at the top source IPs by attack score. The output comes to the screen as normal, uh, but it's also written to that top attackers.dat file. So then in the next query, what I do is I say, uh, source IP, get it from topattackers.dat, the last column of that file. So any file that ends in CSV, TXT, or DAT, and I'm, I'm turning this into a plugin system so you could easily do XLS um, in, in here as well, um, convert that into a terms query and use that as, as my search uh, criteria. And then um, show these fields and, and sort by that attack score. So what you end up with is these documents here, and I've highlighted some of these fields just so that you can see there are three documents here, but then the terms query is automatically generated from the contents of the file. So now I can take this query, I'll put it to a data file, and continue my investigation. 48 minutes. <laughs>